Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father we, do we do pray. Teach us. Teach us, teach us your, way. your way. Teach us, teach us about, your son. about your son. Teach us, teach us about the life about we, the have, life we have. Teach us teach the, way the way we are to, are to walk, walk and live for your glory. We ask the Lord to, Lord to uh, just bless the, bless the preaching of your preaching word. Of your word. Accomplish, accomplish the purpose, purpose for which sense. And Father, we Father, pray, we for, pray those for those that are not able to be with us, that are sick, we pray, pray for new health and strength. And strength. Healing, Healing, Lord, Lord we pray for, uh, for our dear elderly. Our dear elderly that, uh, we, we, we do miss, we do miss now that they're, now not, they're able not able to join with us join for, with us for the evening, service. evening service. Thank you that... Thank uh, you that uh, that some join, some in, join online in online. Just pray, Father, pray, Father for them. For them. You'll give them, give that, them extra, that extra wonderful, wonderful sense of your sense presence, of your your presence joy in, their joy in their hearts, even, even through, through the, the aging, aging process. process. As a reminder, a reminder this morning for your word, we look forward, look to, that forward day to that day when we will be, we will be with Christ, with Christ and be like Christ, 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 Christ and no longer, and no longer deal, deal with it. The pains, the pains and aches of the physical, the physical body, body. No longer, no longer the, the temptations, temptations to sin. sin. And, uh, and uh, Father, we Father, just, we thank, just you thank you. That that, that is that a hope, is that, hope will that, endure that will endure forever. Because Christ because endures. Because Christ endures. And Father, we pray. Father, we pray. Uh, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts. May we hear. May we hear. May we listen. May we listen. May we grow in the May grace. Grow in the, the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. May we hear more, hear of, more our of our sin. And praise Him. Praise in Jesus', in name, Jesus we pray. name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Is the sound working? Okay. This was just clicked on, so. I Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 15. This is a passage in which we are going to see the way in which the Lord in his eternal providence and mercy and sovereignty and predestination chose people from every tribe and tongue. And so we're going to look at the subject of Israel and Gentiles together. Most often when the subject of Israel comes up, it inevitably turns to what has been referred to as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it's considered one of the longest conflicts, having begun in the middle of the 20th century. And this conflict has crossed borders and oceans as other nations take sides, either for or against Israel or for or against Palestine, the Palestinians. And it has also crossed religious borders where Christians and churches often make claim as to who they believe is the good guy and who is the bad. In some instances, this has actually led to conflict and division in the church. Whatever one's view or eschatology or belief concerning the state of Israel and Palestine, we must look at it through the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches us that instead of causing division among His church, it should motivate us more to pray and to pray for both those who are of Israel and those who are of the Palestinians, that they would have less a desire for conflict for an earthly home and more desire for a heavenly one. And isn't that what was the main desire of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We're told that in Hebrews 11, 9, by faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's heart, his desire. They looked for it, and they did not look at the promised land, as it were, as their final home and destination. They saw themselves as foreigners looking for that city in heaven. 
Now, in the preceding verses of Romans that we've studied throughout the weeks and months, maybe even a couple of years, Paul has been giving sound doctrine on which to stand. He exhorts us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven to, to believe those doctrines and to live those doctrines. And then we have seen as we've gone through that we're to, as citizens of Christ, we're to receive one another. And we're to do so in the same manner that Christ has received us. Romans 15, verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Even though we may have some differences as to our understanding of certain truths that are taught in the scriptures we are commanded here to receive one another in the most magnificent manner possible in the manner that god has received us in his son the lord jesus how we have been received by christ and this is what glorifies god do you do you seek to glorify god as a christian well for us it starts and ends with us having the same mind of christ jesus we are taught, and we've seen it again several times in Philippians, where God, where the Lord Jesus, he humbled himself, became a man. As that man, he became a servant of all. He gave his life for us. Even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Through his death on the cross, he reconciled us to the Father, and we're now received by God the Father with the same love as God the Father receives and loves his own Son. In verse 6, Paul writes, With one mind and one mouth, we're to glorify God the Father. And the only way that is accomplished and acceptable is when we are receiving one another as we have been received by Christ. We know of that, that uh, issue of forgiveness that Jesus dealt with in the parable of that one man who forgave a person for just a little bit of money that he owed him. And then that person who he forgave was, uh, or that he had forgiven, went out and he found a person who forgave, who just owed him a little, just a tiny bit. And he wouldn't forgive him. He beat him and put him in jail. That's not the reception we're to have. We're to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. We're to love one another as Christ has loved us. We're to accept and be united together one with another in the same manner that Christ has received us. That is the way then that with one mind and one mouth, we glorify God together. And so it begins with us. And it begins... Uh, with our mind note that again in verse six that you may with one mind this is referring to our new man in christ our new nature uh you can also say our our soul our, our whole being and then this is what unites us it, it's the new birth the new nature the new man created in christ jesus and therefore as we've been born again in the same manner by the same work of god through christ it's then we confess the same thing with one mouth. With one mouth, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we do so to the glory of the Father. And then Paul continues to expound on these things, and these are the verses we're going to take our theme from, our subject matter from, verses 8 through 12. It says, now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. 
And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall have or shall hope. And so here we have expressed for us the reason I started with the subject of the, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What is it that will unite people from both sides? Well, the answer is simply this, the gospel. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the focus Paul has had throughout this whole epistle that he's written. Whether it was the prayer for his own kinsmen who for the most part were under a blindness, or he wrote concerning the tree in which the Gentiles had been grafted, or where, where those of Israel would be grafted back in, and, and, and so on. The main theme, the main thrust of the message is the uniting of one in Christ. The uniting factor was and still is the believing and receiving of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is in Jesus that enemies become brothers, haters become lovers, strangers become family. It's all in Jesus Christ. Now take notice of two terms in these verses, the circumcision and Gentile. Now the two terms are two groups, of course. The circumcision was the term used for the Jews as circumcision was a sign of the covenant in the Old testament the other term being gentiles which is greek for ethnos or we we would just use the word ethnic from the time of moses to the time of jesus earthly ministry gentiles meant anyone not jewish they were outside of israel the nations that were far from god they were outside of his covenant when jesus was born let me just ask what, what you believe and think. Uh, what, uh, what ethnic group, what race was Jesus from? Yeah, he was a Jew. You might think, well, of course. But you know there are people that are, there's a lot of different groups and people that try to give the idea that he was from some sort of other different group. And uh, uh, you have, have some who who claim that he was from africa you have some that claim he he was uh from india and so on these sorts of things uh, it whether whatever race he was from we know that the bible clearly states he was born under the law and we also know that mary and joseph were of the house and lineage of david so clearly his earthly ethnicity was of israel he was this jew so he was born as those who were of the circumcision. And this is uh, further stated in verse 8, where Jesus is called a servant to the circumcision. The word servant is actually where we get the word deacon. It's translated elsewhere in our Bible as deacon. Some people say Stephen was the first uh, deacon of the church killed in the faith. Uh, but in reality, Jesus was the first deacon of the church. He was, of course, uh, killed on the cross and did so for our faith. The point is this, though. Jesus came into this world, and he lived with the Jews as a Jew. And he did so as a servant of God for the circumcision, for the Jews, uh, Quoting what you know well, the words of Jesus in Mark 10, 43, he says, and this shows the purpose of his servanthood in coming into this world as a man born under the law, born in that race of the circumcision. He said, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So of all the things Jesus said of himself, this is one that should humble us the most. This should kind of erase any sense of self-grandeur, 
that we might have. Jesus, just consider it again. The fact that Jesus was one who was from eternity past, before his physical birth, before he became a man. He was the king of glory. He shared glory with the Father. Uh, he's described in Isaiah as being high and lifted up. And the angels, the seraphim, cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And this great, almighty God, he, he comes into this world, and he comes and he humbles himself, and he became a deacon. He became a servant, and not only a servant, but the servant of all by giving his life as a ransom, not for himself, but for many. Now, note Paul's description still in verse 8. A, or a, cert, a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. So he was a servant for the circumcision, for those of his own people, for the truth of God concerning these promises that were made to the fathers, such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, Not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Christ. And so he came to fulfill those promises, the word of God given so long before he came into this world to Abraham. Jesus Christ came. He dwelt among us. He, he dwelt with the people of Israel. And he did so as a faithful servant, fulfilling these promises, which were made again to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, which was that through him, Israel would be saved. Not that every Jewish person would automatically be saved, but the remnant, the elect of God, the reserved by God, chosen in Christ Jesus for the foundation of the world. Now, keep in mind that this epistle was written to what church? What church is this epistle written to? <laughs> I, I love I love giving that questions that the answer is right in front of us because then <laughs> I know who's listening. <laughs> yeah, the church in Rome. Now, Rome was a Gentile city. The, the empire of Rome, Gentiles. Except for the times uh, where Jews were actually kicked out of Rome by the emperor, by the emperor and it happened uh even at the time of paul and others where they they were kicked out that is all the jewish people uh aquila and priscilla were two that were made to leave rome because of that uh the church though when that didn't take place was made up of both jews and gentile believers and with these truths, then, Paul's intention back here in Romans 15 is to remind the Gentiles about something and to remind the Jews about something. And what the, the first reminder is to the Gentiles, the Gentile believers, that though the greater part of Israel had rejected Jesus as the Messiah and crucified him, the mercy of God was still being revealed in that Jews were being saved. People of Jewish race were being added to the church. Paul himself, you recall in the book of Romans, he used himself as an example of that, where he said, has God cast off his people? No. He says, I'm an example. I'm, I'm saved. I'm, I'm a, a child of God through Christ. And so it's the truth that the Jewish believers were testimonies to the fact that God received the remnant of Israel in and through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And since God had not cast off his people from him, the Gentile believers should not cast them off. 
What should they do? They should receive them in like manner as they have been received by Christ. And vice versa, as Paul moves from the circumcision to the Gentiles in verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God. What are you saying, Paul? Gentiles glorifying God? Those unclean dogs? Those pagans you can't be serious. But he is serious. The Holy Spirit is serious. And he directs the reader, the church, back to the Old Testament, back to the scriptures given as evidence. You know, they could argue with Paul about this, but they can't argue with scripture. And there are several passages of scripture that Paul quotes from. He's using here to defend the truth of God's mercy to both Jew and Gentile. Now keep your eyes on Romans 15, 9 through 12, while I read these passages from the Old Testament. 2 Samuel twenty two forty seven. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent men. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king, and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Then you go right back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, beginning at verse 39. Another one where a quote is given by Paul. It says there, now see that I, even I am he. There is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. For I raise my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. I'll make my arrows drunk with blood. And my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. Another call there of rejoicing, O Gentiles, and calling the circumcision to do so and calling them to rejoice with his circumcision, his people. Isaiah 11, verse 6 says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. So what's the, what's the point that's being made? Why is Paul quoting from these portions of Scripture in the Old Testament? Well, as revealed in the passages I've read, the Lord God would bring into his kingdom, kingdom of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, he would bring people from every tribe and nation, every ethnos, every race. He'd call not only the, those of Israel to rejoice in his salvation, but the Gentiles to rejoice and to do so with each other and for each other, for the glory of the Lord's power and might over his enemies and his great marvelous salvation. That those of the circumcision alongside those from the Gentile nations together praise God. Praise the Lord. The Gentiles are as much a part of God's redemptive plan, and they're received by God in the same manner as those who are of the circumcision, Jewish believers. Galatians 3.29 says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, 
an heir according to the promise. Another of the quotes or scriptures that Paul quotes in Romans 15 is one of the shortest Psalms. Here's one that doesn't, don't turn there yet. Uh, but this is just a, a question just to see if anybody knows. Did I tell you what Psalm it was? Okay. Anyone know the shortest Psalm? Right. No, you're good. You, you can go first to the desserts after. <laughs> Psalm 117. Second question. How many verses? Huh? Two. Two. Yeah. That's just a little bit of, uh, of uh, what do they call it? Trivia. Yeah. Here's what it says. Psalm 117 and verse 1. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. How much clearer can it be? <laughs> Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. So that Psalm 117, again, it's the shortest psalm, but it covers the most territory, doesn't it? The whole world, all the nations, all the Gentiles. It has been called by some the gospel psalm because of that, because of its emphasis on all nations, all people praising the Lord. It didn't stop with just the people who are of the nation of Israel, but people from every tribe and tongue declaring the greatness of God, coming into his presence, singing praises to his name. There, there are many other passages of scripture in the Old Testament that speak of the, the light going out to the, the aisles uh, of the Gentiles. And, and so it, it's not just a, a small, uh, just because Psalm 117 is the smallest psalm, doesn't mean it's a small issue in the Bible. Yes. Yeah. So again, close there. <laughs> you can go second to the <laughs> right. Up. Yeah. You know, for many ages, Jehovah was known for the most part, even by the Gentile nations, as the God of Israel. Indeed, he was. And, and there is, of course, the truth of the, the spiritual application that he still is the God of Israel. We are Abraham's seed whether we are of Jewish blood or Gentile blood, because of these promises that were made that began with the promise to Abraham. In you, all the families of the earth, not just one family, but all the families of the earth will be blessed. And how will they be blessed? Through the seed, which is Christ. And, and through that time period, where the nations were far off, Ephesians 2, as we'll see shortly, defines them or describes the Gentiles as being far from God, without hope. During that time, worship of God was viewed as being confined to the temple in Jerusalem. Or the, of course, the sacrifices, the offerings that were made. That was where the presence of God was. Why, even with Daniel, he prayed while he was in Babylon facing Jerusalem. Even there, that is at the temple, Gentiles who desired to worship God were under some restrictions. They were confined to an outer court of the temple, and they could only go into a court that was surrounded by walls that would keep them out of the main temple area. The circumcision and the Gentiles were kept separated. When Jesus ministered in Israel, he spoke of that time when that would all come to an end. That would all change. He spoke of when worship would not be confined to the temple in Jerusalem or on the mountains of Samaria. When he had risen from the dead, he sent his disciples with the message of salvation, not to Israel and calling just Israel to come to Jerusalem, 
but he sent them out into all the world to preach to all to come to Christ. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In some ways, it almost seemed like a reversal in the Old Testament where people, to worship God, they would come to Jerusalem. Now, we're called to go out call people to christ and the church followed this command they began at jerusalem and samaria and then through men like paul to the greeks and roman world and there are there are uh, stories of the other apostles going into other parts of the world including india throughout preaching the gospel now this was one of the sore points that the unbelieving jews hated paul for we know that Paul, who once hated Jesus and his followers, now preached Christ, and he preached Christ first to the circumcision, but then he turned and was called an apostle to the Gentiles. So he preached to both Jew and Gentile. He writes in Romans 10, verse 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. And he uses the word Greek that covers again, all, really all the nations. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Note there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. That to me takes away this whole idea that there are two God's people. There's only one people of God, and that are those who are in Christ, Jew and Gentile. There's no difference between Jew or Greek because we're all born sinners. And it, it does not matter what race you're born into. All people are born dead and at enmity with God. And there's no difference because all must be saved the same way. We must all be saved through Christ. We must all come by faith. It's not by our parents, it's not by our church, it's not by our being British, Spanish, Afghan, Palestinian, or Jewish. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and there's no distinction. Back in Romans 14 and 15, Paul had been referring to weak believers and strong believers, how they're to support each other and receive each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And now he turns his attention to this aspect of race, reminding the Jews, reminding the Gentiles that they are now one in Christ. There's no distinction. Both the saved Jew and the Gentile uh, believers are one in Christ. They're received by Christ. They have both become equal recipients of the promises of God. All the promises are in Christ. And that's made clear in Ephesians 2. I want to read this passage because it actually explains it far better than I could. Ephesians chapter 2. As we read it, take note of some of the terms again that are used. Circumcision, uncircumcision, Gentiles, middle wall of partition, which has reference back to that when I mentioned about the wall in the temple where Gentiles were kept separate. Uh, terms such as far off, strangers, and fellow citizens, a commonwealth of Israel, and among others. Uh, and it all brings us to see that there is no distinction, but we are all one in Christ. And so beginning, I'll begin at verse 11. There is so much of this we could read, but we'll begin there. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
But now, and that's a big but now, <laughs> but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of, part of separation or partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Note taking the two and making one. So it's not two, it's one. And that, verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God, note, in one body through the cross, therefore, or thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that's the Gentiles, and those who were near, the circumcision. For through him we both, Gentile, circumcision, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Remember, that was the temple, but now it's not. It's through Christ. We now enter in by the Spirit of God. Verse 19, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Here, here's the temple. We're the temple. Gentile and Jew believers. No distinction. We're one and one building, one temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's the whole issue of calling the Gentiles to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord. Because we are that temple. And God is, the Spirit of God now dwells in us. We're the dwelling place of, of the Lord, where, where the temple that was built in Jerusalem was, was that place in which if you read of Solomon, when they dedicated the temple, it filled with the Shekinah glory of God, the, the, that it was so thick, they, they weren't able to enter in. But we enter in together through Christ, because we are built together for that dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And what is it that unites us together? And it's not the blood that flows through our bodies. It's the blood that flowed from the cross, Calvary. I've not seen it personally, but I've heard the wonderful news of churches that gather together in Israel and Palestine where people from every tribe and tongue worship, even believing Palestinian and Jewish believers in Christ. That enmity has been broken. And it's been broken throughout the world and the Lord is bringing us together as one in him. This is the promise of God. This is the promise in the book of Revelation, where before the throne of God are those from every tribe, tongue, and nation, worshiping the Lamb of God. This is why we worship and praise God together, even though we come from many races and ethnic groups, even in this little congregation. These passages that we've just read are very much specifically for you and for me who are not of Jewish blood. Aren't you so thankful that God sent the, the Lord Jesus Christ to save both Jew and Gentile? <laughs> we would still be, of, if that wasn't the case, in Ephesians 2, far from God and hopeless, completely hopeless. But Christ came. He came as a servant. And we're part of the fulfillment of the promises made in the Old Testament. As the one where it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. 
until Jesus comes, let's continue to praise the Lord and, and go into all the world and preach the gospel. Let's make disciples of all nations. Let's make known one gospel, one Savior, with one mind, with one voice, praising the Lord and receiving each other as Christ has received us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.